Best Book Bitch podcast brings you Renee Marino, film and Broadway actress and performer, professional communications coach, keynote speaker, and author of her new published book, Becoming a Master Communicator. Renee, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. No worries. Now, for an audience who might not know you, who might know you as the actress uh, from the Clint Eastwood film, The Jersey Boys, I want you to go back to the beginning. Talk to me about the 18-year-old Renee. Who is she and what is she doing? What were you dreaming about and how did your story unfold from there on in? My story unfolded in a town in New Jersey called Linden, and I grew up in an Italian-American household, very close-knit with my father, my mother, my grandmother, and my older brother. And Michael, you could often find us sitting around the kitchen table eating. That was our, our main focus, but always laughing, conversating, arguing, but nonetheless communicating and connecting through those conversations. And I believe in my heart that that's where my passion for communication began, which at that point as a little girl was really more focused on communicating from the stage and being a performer and one day being on Broadway. It was interesting because no one in my family uh, were performers. My father was a, a factory worker. My mother worked as a hairdresser. My grandfather was a, was a ballroom dancer back in the day, but there was no sense of, I want to make this a career. And then here I come, <laughs> the oddball in the family. And my family was always so supportive, but they definitely advised me that it's a big dream, Renee. It's, it's almost like wanting to become a quarterback in the NFL, but there was that fire within me and I started taking dance class and then doing community theater. And that first time I sang a vocal solo, I'll never forget it in a show, George M. And it was down by the Erie. It was like down by the Erie, there waits my pal. And I caught the bug. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do with my life. And I started taking private voice lessons, continued with the dance classes. And when it was time for college, I told myself, I, I know that my one true love is performing. So I want to major in musical theater. And again, everyone told me, Renee, you're crazy. You need something to fall back on. It's such an unstable career, which is very true. But I said, no, I'm going to do it. And I attended Wagner College in Staten Island, New York, a beautiful school, liberal arts program. And I majored in musical theater. And what I loved is that it wasn't a conservatory. So it wasn't just all dedicated to performing. I still had my liberal arts courses, but then I really had my focus in performing, being in theater. And it was the best training I could have asked for. Right after that, the day after college graduation, I was on a plane to Biloxi, Mississippi to be the lead singer in a casino show called Heat Wave. And that's where it began. And that was in Mississippi, is that correct? Yes. Yep. And what did you what did you do when you called your mom when you when you got uh, your first paycheck? Oh my goodness, Michael. I will never forget this moment. And I talk about it in the book. I was standing on the balcony in my hotel room overlooking the Gulf and I got my first paycheck. Now you have to understand I'm 21 years old at this point, And I had been performing since five years old, not always professionally, but for me, it was my love. It, it was my passion. The quote that I used in all of my college essays to, um, you know, apply for school was when you find a job you like, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's what it always felt like to me. Performing was just what I love to do. So when I got that first paycheck at 21 years old for singing and dancing two shows a night in, in a casino show, I was like, Oh my God. And I called up my mom and I said, mom, I just got paid to do what I love. I can't believe it. And that's when I knew that I was doing the right thing and I was meant to be in this career. It's an amazing story. Now, for people that uh, haven't read the book, when did the book come out, uh, Renee? Let's uh, dive into that for, for one second. Was it today yes. or yesterday? Yes, my book launched yesterday, everybody, January 25th, 2022. And it was one of the greatest days of my life. Extremely surreal because this book, actually the first time I sat down because I had an idea to write a book on communication was 2017. And I want you all to hear that and hear that well, because 
I think oftentimes we all put this pressure on ourselves that if there's a dream we want to achieve, it has to be done right now. It has to be done here and everything has to be perfect and in alignment. And the truth is the road to our dreams, the road to accomplishing our dreams is not a straight path. It's very all over the place and we have ups and downs and when I started writing it, I was performing in my most recent Broadway show, Pretty Woman, and I just sat down. I didn't know what it took to write a book, but I knew that there was a calling deep within me, so I just sat down and began writing. And yesterday, it launched to the world, and I couldn't be more grateful. Yeah, amazing stuff. Now, I want to go back in time. So, from school, um, the community theater doing the Mississippi casino gig, how did you get into theater in your 20s? And what did you do in your 20s? So how did it all unfold through there? Take us through the timeline because your bio is uh, seven pages long. So I want to hear (laughs) it. Yes. Let us know. Absolutely. Well, once I finished the casino show, that was three and a half months I felt like I'd made it. And I did, like I did, you know, I was 21 years old being the lead singer and dancer in a casino show. My picture was on billboards on the interstate. When my family came to see me, they were like taking photos. I was like, this is amazing. I moved back home with my family in New Jersey. And as my day job, I was a substitute teacher for my former high school. So picture how trippy that is, everybody. I was just there four years prior and now I'm a teacher. (laughs) I loved it. I obviously was always meant to be a coach because I always loved teaching. I taught dance for so many years. So I did that. And when I had free periods, I would look up auditions and there was a, and there still is an outlet called backstage that I used to look through, find the auditions. And then I would go into the city. I would audition my little butt off. I would face tons and tons of rejections because that is a part of this field. If you're going to be a performer, if that's your dream, it's really important for you to know that there's going to be a lot of no. And by you understanding that and being aware of that, you then don't take it so personally. So I'd audition. I sang with a couple big wedding bands. We would perform for celebrity weddings. And then I went to an audition for the 25th anniversary tour of the musical Cats. They were going to be touring all around North America for a year. And I booked it as a swing. And a swing, for those of you who don't know, is a person in the cast, extremely important role, who covers several different roles at once. So I covered six different Cats. And that meant that if any of those six were sick and couldn't be in the show for whatever reason, I was in. And I had to know exactly where to go, exactly what to do, and hit my marks. And that was, yeah, it, it was incredible, Michael. It was a year. We went to Mexico, Alaska, all over, all over the U.S. And it was one of the most powerful trainings I could ever ask for out of the gate because to be able to be a swing, and be so self-motivated and be able to do several roles at once. That takes a lot of focus, a lot of, as I said, self-motivation. And after I did that show, I was like, all right, I can do anything. I did six roles of, and still in my opinion, one of the hardest musicals ever. I got this. I I could keep going. Yeah. One of the things, uh, one of the biggest takeaways I got from that and what you said is you got thousands of no's in your 20s, which made you rejection proof. And it wasn't the no's, it was those small wins that led to bigger and greater things. So talk to me about the bigger and greater things that came from Cats. What was the next musicals and how did sort of it unfold through there? Yes. After Cats. So I did that for a year. And then my goal was to get my equity card. And equity card means that you are now a part of the actors union. So you get health insurance, you get a a better salary. And for me, that was the, that was the smaller goal, right? Along that bigger goal to Broadway. Because I had that goal, I had to turn down several jobs. There were several jobs that I, uh, booked, but they weren't offering me my equity card. So I had to say no. And that's something else I think that's really important to impress upon everyone listening that sometimes when we have our vision so clear, 
and we know what the next steps are, it takes some maneuvering. And sometimes that maneuvering is you putting your foot down on what isn't serving you for that bigger dream. And it was tempting, trust me, because as a performer, you can be high on, uh, you know, living as a Tony Award winner and then the next day be out of work. So it's, it is very unstable. So to say no to jobs, it's like, oh, are you crazy? But for me, it was never about money. This was always about wanting to be on Broadway and, and seeing myself in the heart of New York City doing what I loved. And I kept that vision really clear. So I turned down several jobs. And then the next thing that I auditioned for was the world premiere of Disney's High School Musical. If you all remember, Disney's High School Musical was like a huge craze. The movie came out, you know, we're all in this together. And we were the first stage version. Well, I booked it. And I have to tell you another memory that stays so clear in my mind is when they told me I booked it. I was in the studio where we auditioned. It's called Chelsea Studios on like West 26th Street in Manhattan. And I start screaming. I start running up and down the hallway. It was probably, I know it was probably so obnoxious because everyone else in the other studios were probably like, oh great, she booked Broadway. Meanwhile, it was the fact that I got my equity card and I was going to be making like, I forget what the salary was, but I called up my grandmother this time and I was like, Graham, because she lived with us growing up. Graham, Graham, I got my equity card. And my grandmother, who doesn't even know what that is, she's just so happy because I'm so happy. And she's like, oh, I'm so happy for you. And we're on the phone. I'm crying. And that was my next gig. So we did that in Atlanta and then got word that they were going to be doing a national tour of it. So then I went on tour for nine months, living my dream. I was I was understudying Sharpay Evans. I went on for her all the time. I got to perform when we uh, presented on the Disney lot. I got to be Sharpay. It was like the most incredible experience. But still, I felt that little voice in the back of my head. I, I call it the quiet voice of our souls telling me like, Renee, you still didn't get your Broadway debut. So I left. And everyone thought I was crazy because we were making such great money. I mean, it was Broadway salary. And when you tour, you also get per diem. So I was making the most money I ever did in my whole life. But I left. And wow. all of my friends were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I need to get to New York. And again, a another lesson. Sometimes we, we have to turn down the shiny, bright object in front of us, the, the money and the, and the riches and the, the glamorous side of life to get to where we want to go. And that's what I did. And then I went back to New York City again, auditioned nonstop for about a month. And then I booked the Universal Swing for three companies of Jersey Boys. Now, a Universal Swing is the same thing as a swing, but for different companies. So just to give you an idea, when I covered the national tour, the Vegas company and the Chicago company. So if they needed me in any of those places, they would fly me out. Renee, we need you in Vegas next week. And you're probably going to cover Francine. And I had to know not only that role, but the role from that cast, which even though it's the same show, they were all slightly different. So I would have my separate sets of index cards for each cast and each company. Wow. And it was not just physical. Being a swing like that, it's so mental because you have to be on top of it. And I'm sure you get this, Michael. It's like sometimes things are harder when they're so similar. Like if I was doing a different show and had to know those roles, it probably would have been easier because it wasn't so closely related. Like I would go to Chicago company and the final pose would be my right arm up. But then when I was on the tour, it would be my left arm up. And it sounds simple, but it trips you out. So again, such incredible training. And for me, this was so special because I'm really from New Jersey. I grew up listening to Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. And it was like a dream show. So I was like, okay, even though 
I said this to myself and it was the truth, even though this isn't, I'm not booked in the Broadway show. This is still such an incredible show that I want to be a part of. So I want to tour with it. Yeah, absolutely. It. Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I want to jump into your book soon. But uh, the reason why we're going through the backstory is because what it leads up to now. So talk to me about the story of miscommunication and, and how your big break came about only because you had the courage to talk honestly what was in your heart and how it, you know, if it didn't come from courage and how you might have missed your big break. So who was in the audience while you're performing Jersey Boys and how did that story unfold? In 2013, I was playing the role of Mary Delgado in Jersey Boys on Broadway. So now we fast forwarded some years and I got asked to cover the role because the girl playing the role was on maternity leave. So they brought me in. This was like the biggest dream come true. My family could all come in from New Jersey, see me in New York City. And one Sunday matinee, I go out on stage to sing my boyfriend's back with the girls and 10 rows back is Clint Eastwood. Yes, the legend himself. And I heard through one of my coworkers that day that he was coming around to all the different casts of Jersey Boys to see the actors play the roles because he was going to be directing the film. And at that point, I didn't think much of it to be so transparent. I didn't think twice about it because in my mind, I said, they're going to hire A-list celebrities out of Los Angeles to be the Jersey Boys and to play Mary Delgado. Marissa Tomei is probably going to play my role. So I didn't think too much into it, but it was amazing to have this legend watching my performance. Fast forward a few weeks, they start calling in people from our cast to audition and they put out a breakdown for my role. So what that means is they put out a description for the type of person they were seeking for Mary Delgado. And to be quite honest, it was me. It was like sassy Jersey girl, Frankie's first wife, um, spitfire, funny, sarcastic. And, and I was playing the role at the highest level you could on Broadway. So I call my agent and I'm like, listen, I'd love to get an audition for this. She's like, I'm on it. Weeks go by. Every girl I know on Broadway is getting an appointment for Mary Delgado, but me. And at this point, Michael, I was so confused because I'm thinking I'm playing her. Like I, I am her. Like Clint saw me play the role. She calls me back. Renee, I'm so sorry. I don't know what the problem is, but they won't see you for the role of Mary, but they'll give you an audition for one of the angels who sing my boyfriend's back. Well, I hung up the phone. And that moment, Michael, I felt my feelings. I cried. I felt so frustrated because I was just thinking to myself, I remember saying this a lot. I was like, God, what are you trying to tell me? If I can't even get an audition for something I'm already playing, am I not supposed to be in this career? And I felt my feelings, which is step one of being a master communicator is that communication with yourself, letting yourself feel what needs to be felt. Yeah. But soon after, 30 minutes later, I threw my hands up. I said, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go in and audition for one of the angels. I get to the audition that day on Wall Street. I'll never forget it. And the casting director, Jeffrey McClatt, wonderful casting director, is telling me how much he loved the show. He saw it the night before. And then he said, would you like to sing the song first or read the scene for one of the angels? And at that moment, I could literally feel something rise within me. And I heard again, that quiet voice from within say, Renee, you have to do this. It feels too right. And at that moment, I just look at him and I say, you know, Jeff, I was really hoping to come in and read for the role of Mary Delgado. And I was like, what is he going to say? And he looks back at me and he goes, I was just thinking the same thing. And I'm like, amazing. So I went in the hallway for about 20 minutes, went through the Mary scenes after doing the Angels audition, I did that first. I come back in, do the Mary audition, and I left there that day feeling so happy. And this is why. Not because I ever thought I was going to be playing a lead female role in a major film. It was because I had the confidence to communicate from my heart that day that I opened up a door of opportunity for myself. And two weeks later, I get a call. I happened to be at my childhood home in New Jersey, Michael, down the street from where the entire storyline of Jersey Boys takes place. 
And it's my agent saying, you're Mary Delgado in the movie, Clint Eastwood loves you. And I'm like, Wah! screaming. I'm going to fast forward because I can give you every detail. But well, I'll, 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 I'll add in some details. So you're yes. in your childhood bedroom and you're about to go to the wedding and your family was there and you scream. They think someone's dead. You walk out and everyone <laughs> starts crying because yeah. you're an A-list actress um, for the, you know, Frankie Valley's wife and who, if you haven't watched the movie Jersey Boys, people, go out and watch it because it's an amazing movie and I'm sure we'll get Renee to sing later on. I'm joking. Continue, Ooh, Renee. <laughs> okay, baby. Yeah, um, great story. Now, in the book, you detail it really well and it, and it really hits home for me that to go back to when you spoke to that um, casting director, the miscommunication and, and we'll basically just touch on this really and because it's in your book, the thing with communication is miscommunication. Now, Clint always wanted you to play the role, but it was miscommunicated through uh, a middle a middle person. So, can you talk a little bit about miscommunication before yes, we jump on? Absolutely. I want to fast forward now, Michael. Would you, would you like me to share the end of that story, or should we? Please, have yeah, yeah. Just just great. let's let's tie great. that shoelace up. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. So I'm on the set on the Warner Brothers lot. And just to preface this for all of you, I never was in a TV show, film, nothing before. This was my first time literally doing anything like this. I had just been a stage actress. So I had to throw my, my arms out into the world and say, all right, Renee, you need to trust yourself. Clint Eastwood hired you for a reason. Well, every day that we would film, Clint Eastwood and I would eat lunch together and I would communicate with him as much as I could, asking him questions, listening to everything he had to say, absorbing it like a sponge. And this is where communication is so powerful, not when you're the one speaking or communicating, but when you're the one listening. I learned so many life lessons, not even having to do with acting, but just living as a human being. And Fast forward to about a month into the project, we're eating lunch, him, myself, and the producer of the film. When they begin talking about how Clint knew that he wanted me for the role when he saw me perform on Broadway. Now, let me remind you all, that was weeks and weeks and weeks before they even gave me an audition. So I drop my fork and I say, do you guys want to hear a funny story? I actually didn't even have an audition for Mary Delgado. The only reason I got to read the scenes is because I opened up my big mouth in the room and asked. And the two of them stop, look at one another so confused, and they said, what do you mean? We requested you. We said we want the girl from Broadway to come in an audition. Well, come to find out that day, as Michael just shared, there was a middle person casting associate juggling a few films at once and just dropped the ball. So think about this. If I did not have the confidence to communicate in the room that day, I could have missed my once in a lifetime opportunity. I would have been moving about my life, never knowing that Clint Eastwood was waiting for me to walk through that door the entire time. And um, didn't he go about and say, where's, um, where's, where's Mary? Where's, where's the Mary I'm looking for? And then, then you appeared and then he's like, there you are. So <laughs> yeah, going from show to show. Now I want to just touch on that. I know you had lunch with Clint every day and it was like having a masterclass as well. Tell me a little story about when Clint and Meryl used to act um, and how Meryl used to do, you know, dozens of takes. And then he said, you know, I'll let you do the story, but talking about authenticity from the heart and just letting your heart speak, not your head speak. So expand on that a little bit. One of the greatest lessons that I learned from the man himself, Mr. Eastwood, was the gift of imperfection. If any of you are like myself, I lived most of my life being a perfectionist, constantly beating myself up. It's not perfect. You have to do it again. What's wrong with you, Renee? Listening to that inner critic, and I was filming the big breakup scene between Frankie and Mary on the Warner Brothers lot. And in the scene, Mary, my character, is drunk, pissed off. Frankie's been on the road, not home. And she's walking up the stairs and Frankie's following her and they're yelling. Well, we do the scene once and then they yell cut and then Clint goes, good. Now I want you to really give it to him. And I'm like, okay. So we go back and I get ready and we start the scene again. And now I'm like fuming and I'm like, you show up for a couple of days and you think that makes you a father. And, a, ah! 
And out of nowhere, I forget all of my lines. Like they just boop right out of my head. But like a second later, I pick it right back up and I keep going. Clint yells cut and he goes, that was it. I go, Clint, I forgot all my lines. And he goes, I don't care. It was real and it was raw and that's good. He said, when I was filming Meryl and I'm like, oh my God. Clint Eastwood's talking to me about Meryl Streep. What is happening? What is my life right now? And he said, when I would film with her, she always liked to do tons of takes to make it perfect. But then I started filming her rehearsal takes and she realized how organic and raw they were. And she had me film them all the time. And that made me realize, wow, we work so hard to be what we perceive as perfect, but nothing Nothing is better than being authentic, being real. And the truth is, when we're all upset and angry and frustrated, sometimes you forget what you're going to say if you're arguing with your spouse or a friend and you're screaming. It's like, sometimes you forget what you're about to say. And he recognized that. And by him recognize that, recognizing that in me and then sharing that story, it was like this beautiful light bulb went off. And since then, I'm not kidding. That was 2013. I have lived my life so differently, remembering how beautiful imperfection is. Imperfection is human, right? And nothing, nothing is more real or authentic than being human. And, and we just need to lean into that. It's funny that from all the, your experiences, uh, just an offhand comment from someone can really change your life. And and, and that's sort of old school communication uh, yes. as well uh, that we talk about. Now, uh, just a couple of quick questions. I watched Jersey Boy last night. That's why I'm wearing this. So I just wanted you to feel comfortable pretending it. you're speaking to Frankie, your husband, because, you know, dressing yes. up like Frankie. So that's why I thought I'd put on the, um, put on the jacket. You look uh, so gra- handsome. I, I oh, almost I want to send this to all the Jersey Boys so they can see you because because they will well, love I it. can we we can sing as well, and we can do a little bit of sherry, or you know, my boyfriend's back. But Woo! yeah, we won't do that today. It's a podcast. <laughs> okay, so um, talk to me about the professionalism of actors and and what your experience or what your pickups were with the sort of just the professionalism being on being on set, uh, being in a major you know Warner Brothers movie, flying first class in, having someone stand in your position where you thought, hey, I'll do that, and you're like, wow, having your own trailer, so. Talk to me about that whole experience and, and what that did for you, um, you know, post post movie and the premiere as well. How was, how did, what did you pick up from there? Absolutely. Well, as I said, I had never been amongst the atmosphere of, of a film or a film set. And I was a sponge the entire time. It was like a, a it was just like a, a baby learning to walk for the first time, but the, the powerful thing about that is that I really learned to trust myself. The greatest observation I had on that film set was the leadership quality of Clint Eastwood. Now, before I step foot on this set, I, you know, you think, you you assume, right? We all assume things, how it's going to be, what it's going to be like. And working with the top, the, the cream of the crop directors, Clint Eastwood, I'm thinking, well, he's going to be standing up there telling everybody exactly what to do, what he needs from them. And he runs the show and it was the opposite. It was this beautiful collaboration of his team that he trusts so much. And the first thing I felt when I walked through the door that day, all I heard was Renee, welcome. And I felt like I was back with my family. Like it was open arms. It was love. It was collaboration And the funny thing, Michael, was that Clint is the opposite of a micromanager. I remember I was doing the pizza scene where Frankie and uh, Mary have their first date. And I'll never forget, we do one take. And Clint only does a few takes, by the way. And Clint walks over to me. Now, he didn't say like, Renee, be more like this or try this or give me more of this. Never, never accept that breakup scene that I shared with you when he said, really give it to him. Well, he walks up to me and he goes, you know, you look like Veronica Lake right now. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. But then I was like, oh, well, would you like me? Is that okay? Do you want me to say the line a different way? He's like, no, it's great. And he just walks away. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like he 
trusts his people so much. And the beautiful part about that is by him trusting me, that activated that trust within myself, which allowed me to be free as an actor to explore what I wanted to explore. And I was able to perform at my best which then gave him what he wanted for those scenes. I want to share this with you because unfortunately this scene was cut from the film, but there was a scene where Frankie, myself, and our little daughter friend scene were at the dinner table and we're eating dinner and Mary's a bit tipsy and she's arguing with Frankie again. And Clint let us improv, I would say for about 10 minutes. And it was the most incredible experience. He just let the cameras keep rolling. And all I can tell you is by the end of it, I was throwing the bread basket at John Lloyd Young, who was my Frankie Valley, and we're going at it. And he yells cut. And there was dead silence on the set. And all of a sudden, one of the crew guys were like, that's just like my marriage. And everybody <laughs> breaks out in laughter. That's but awesome. The reason I share this with you is because afterwards, Clint and John and I walk out and Clint was like, that was incredible. I can't wait to edit that. And through the editors, one of the editors of the film told me that this was Clint's, one of Clint's favorite scenes. And it was in the film all the way to like the, almost the final cut. And then they had to cut it, not from his uh, doing, but the higher ups. But what's so cool about that is that was all us. Like, like I got to do what, what I did and what I saw in this moment for this character. And that's what the whole experience was like. Seeing Clint Eastwood have no ego, trust the people around him. And that for me was a huge lesson in leadership that the best leaders lead by being and not by telling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could, we could unpack this, but I want to jump into the book. But one last question I've got for you just regarding to the movie. So my beautiful friends, Ruth and James, have a, a daughter named Eve. So shout out to Eve. She's 15 years old. Now, we went away recently to their holiday home. And I asked her, I said, what do you want to do when you're older? And she said, I want to be an actress and performer. And she's got a question for you. She's 15 years old. She wants to know, what is the very first thing you did when you decided to become an actress and performer. What was the very first thing you did? First of all, hello, Eve. I'm sending you so much love and positive vibes. The first thing I did was sign up for private voice lessons. The second thing I did was never stop. Never stop training. Because Eve, what I want you to understand, and everyone who is an aspiring performer, your body is your tool right? Now as a communication coach, I use my computer a lot and I use my microphone and I have my book as a resource. But when you're a performer, your body is your only tool. So you need to keep it in tune, just like you tune up your computer or you tune up your car or you charge your phone. So constantly being in dance class, in acting class, in voice lessons, it's an ongoing process. And you'll hear from some of the most successful Broadway stars out there. They're still in class because your body is, is a living, breathing thing. And you have to keep it well oiled and take really, really good care of it. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, I'll You're share welcome. that with her as well. So let's fast forward to becoming a master communicator. Hold up the book. Show me the book again Woo! for everyone out there. Go and go and buy it. Go and read it because uh, I had the privilege of reading it before it came out, and I can tell you it is one of those amazing uh, communications books. So why did you write it first? And um, yeah, give us a little backstory on on how you put it together. As I told you all when we started this interview, I've always been obsessed with communication, how people communicate, why they communicate in the way they do, and that stemmed from my own upbringing. Well, fast forward to doing my last Broadway show, Pretty Woman the Musical, and my girlfriends and I in the dressing room, greatest times, sharing and talking, and I remember one of my, my girlfriends talking about a guy that she was dating. And she was really into him, but she didn't know how he felt. And I asked a question that I thought was the simplest of questions, but the answer I got was not what I expected. And I just asked, well, did you talk to him about it? Like, did you talk about how you're feeling or where this is going? And she was like, oh no, like, 
No. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, that's step one, right? If you're not communicating and not figuring out what playing field you're both on, then we have problems. So that got that idea in my brain that was like, I need to write a book about this because this response is my friend is not the only one who's ever said that I've heard from a slew of people. I don't want to rock the boat. I actually don't speak about how I feel because I'm not a confrontational person. And and I'm thinking to myself, communication doesn't mean confrontation. So after getting that answer, that's when I started writing the book. And then Michael, I was at a restaurant and my friend and I met up to catch up and we're having the the best time. And next to us, it's a family of five parents, a teenage son and two young children. And the entire meal, it was about an hour and a half. None of them spoke because they were all on a digital device. The parents and the teenage son on their cell phones and the two young kids on their video games. And I couldn't help but take notice because here we are like cackling, laughing, eating and catching up. And there was silence next to us, even when the meal came out and my heart broke because I thought to myself, these are precious moments of, of time. The one thing we can't get back being wasted on having their heads down in the virtual world and not in the real world, connecting with their loved ones. And that was when I further narrowed down what this book was going to be about. And I said, I must shine a light on this because technology, new school technology, as I call it, is such a gift, right? Like you and I are here right now together. How beautiful is that? But if we don't learn how to consciously connect, we're going to have so many problems in our relationships at work and in our lives. So I wanted to use this book to just shine a light on a problem that is only going to get worse because technology is only getting more and more advanced. So we need to really become aware of this now. So that way we become in control and conscious of how and when we're using our digital devices. Yeah. The the book really sort of hit home for me. Now I've read a lot of books and done a lot of summaries on communication, but you blend old school simplicity with which is pre-digital technology with new technology and it's sort of the first book i've ever read where you go back in time where writing letters speaking to people from the heart having a three-hour conversation without a digital device they they that was the 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 main avenue for communication and then fast forwarding now where we can't escape our devices cameras everything we want to blend the two talk to me about that great story in the book where you talk about that family where the man comes home from work the wife's got the dinner cooked they have a dinner and then they put the radio on what do they do next in that little lounge room when they listen to the music yes so this was my dear friend i'm friends with all of my high school teachers they were at my wedding i mean i Again, I love connection. Communication is connection and creating genuine connections for me is so natural. And I think the reason we're here on on this earth. So I was at one of my teacher's homes and another teacher was over. And at the time she was 87 years young. And we start talking about my book. I was in the process of writing it. And she tells me this beautiful story how when she was a little girl, her and her brother and their parents would have dinner. And then every night after dinner, they would push the tables aside and they would dance the polka and they would dance the polka. Her father would, would take out his, his instruments that he made with his own two hands out of copper tubing. And they would dance and laugh and connect. And there was no digital outsider coming in to distract them. And I share that in chapter four. And I just love that story so much because it makes me, it reminds me in my own life to infuse every day with those moments where I'm disconnected, where it's just me and my husband and my dog and my mom, whoever it may be, just really actively listening and actively being present with those who are in front of me. Yeah. 
Great story. Uh, and for those who, you know, read the, buy the book because it's one of those books that for the next 10 years will be relevant to, to what we're talking about now. Now, give us a breakdown on sort of um, new tech, new school of technology, which both inhibits and sort of Im- improves our communication. So, yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. New school technology, as I said, it's such a gift. But just like anything, too much of anything is not good. So in chapter two, I really talk about how technology is just allowing our lives to thrive. Again, we all are in the midst of so much change. We went through a pandemic. Hopefully we're on the way out. But if we didn't have Zoom, if we didn't have FaceTime and Skype and all of these outlets to connect us, oh my goodness, it would be such a lonely time, lonelier than it, than it was. And than it can be, it keeps us connected to our loved ones. It allows us technology to have empathy for those that we've not even met in person. Like think about when someone posts something, um, online, maybe they're doing a GoFundMe for someone who's dealing with a health issue or whatever the situation may be. And you see that and you, reach out, you donate, you send a message of love and a message of sharing a story that you went through. We, we have these beautiful moments of connection where we get to realize that we are all on this same team of humanity. Whether I'm in the U S you're in Australia, you're in the UK, whatever the case, we are all on the same team. And through technology, we get to see that we get to feel like the people that we admire are up close and personal. It's amazing. Musicians, musicians get to create their art without having to spend a million dollars with renting studio space or, or paying other musicians to help them. They can use something like garage band, right? All of these resources we have at our fingertips. But on the flip side, when we over utilize these resources, when instead of meeting face to face with you, Michael, I'm just constantly texting you. And what's the problem there? You can't read tone through a text. How many times have I sent a text to a friend quickly? And then I look back and I'm like, Oh my God, it auto corrected. And that is not what I meant to say. Right. It can cause so many issues. And you'll see in the book, I share so many personal stories where some of the people that I was closest to in my life, there was so much tension because of an inability to consciously communicate without the phones, without the computer. When we write emails, how many times at work? I'd love, if I could see you all, I know I'd see a lot of show of hands, people who are like, oh my goodness, I was at work and my boss writes me and is like, where's that document I needed? And I sent it, but then we realized it went to spam. And what happens now you're stressed out because your boss thinks you're inadequate. Your boss didn't get what they needed because what happens? We don't check back because we assume technology is going to work perfectly and then issues begin. So if we don't understand how to balance these two worlds, this is where the tensions arise. This is where issues arise. And we want to, I know we all want this. We want to live lives where the life that we have posted on our vision boards is real. It it is possible, but it can only be possible if we make communication as our priority in our lives, authentic, honest, and clear communication as a priority. And that is the intention for this book. Thank you for sharing. And one of the stories that really got me in the book was uh, when you were texting back and forward to one of your girlfriends and you, you're busy. She's busy and you try to arrange dinner and uh, obviously let's postpone it two or three times and then she cracks the shits and writes you back a text message and you're like, shit, we got to the, yeah, you, you tell the story, tell the story. Yeah. A little bit about that. Yeah. Dear, dear friend of mine, we're, we've been trying to get together for dinner only through text, right? Here's the danger zone, only through text. I'm busy. She's busy. And because my schedule was so nuts, I kept having to change it. So it was like probably the third time now. And after the third time being like, I'm so sorry, I can't do it again. Boo hoo on me. She writes me back and she's like, you know what? Let's just forget it. And in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, Renee, are you kidding me? Pick up the phone. And at that second, I picked up the phone. 
Well, of course, I got sent a voicemail, left a message. This went on for about a week. And finally, when we spoke, I was correct in, in my belief that she was frustrated. And what she said was, Renee, it just felt like you were trying to find a way out of this. So I just said, let's put the kibosh on it and we're not going to go to dinner. And I said, I am so sorry because I know that's how it came off. And when I look back at those text messages, I would have thought the same thing. I should have picked up the phone right from the get-go because you know what we would have done? Avoided all of this wasted time. Again, the one thing we can't get back and the wasted energy, me stressing that you're upset with me, you being frustrated with me, thinking I don't want to see you. And then the problems escalate. How many times in our lives has that happened, right? Where a problem that probably could have been solved in four minutes, sometimes last years, How many people haven't spoken to family members or friends in years and years? And then when they finally speak again, they go, uh, I don't even remember what we were fighting about. Uh, It's heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. So I, my goal and my wish is that this book helps people to avoid that. We have enough problems in the world. Really? There's enough that goes on that we don't have the control over. Why not control what we can? And do it simply. This is this is my whole belief is that this book is meant to, to sh- let us realize that it, it's simpler than we think. It's so much simpler, Michael, when I pick up the phone or say, can we meet to talk? And and you can feel my energy and, and feel the sincerity of what I'm saying rather than sending you 45 emails, right? <laughs> It is crazy. And, uh, you know, I, I do book summaries. So I've sort of done a mini summary of your book so far, but I'll just go through some notes because we, we could chat for hours, but we are not Joe Rogan. We don't do three hour podcasts. <laughs> um, okay. So you talk about how technology inhibits communication. So I'll just go through some notes and then you can expand about it. So um, or we'll do a hot shot round. So I'm going to say some things and I want you to expand on it. So we don't make small talk. Talk to me about that. We don't make small talk. We don't make small talk anymore. Small talk. Remember when you used to go sit in a doctor's office and you have magazines and you kind of look around, you smile at one another, you end up in conversation with someone that you end up having a mutual friend or you end up speaking to that person that ends up being the person you fall in love with. That's becoming a lost art. Why? Because the minute we sit without something actively going on, we pick up our cell phones. We have our heads down. And let me tell you something, everyone. We are keeping chiropractors in business because we all have what they call military neck, which is from always having our heads jotted out and down in our phones. I've never heard about that. See, that's a little small talk that I just learned something because I asked you about small talk. Now, we're denying ourselves opportunities uh, by always being glued to our phones instead of staying open. And available. So we're denying ourselves of opportunities. Yes. Thoughts on that? Think think about when you walk into an establishment and you hold the door open for someone. And maybe if you're someone single, all of a sudden you're like, oh my, oh my gosh, here she's cute, right? And then you start making conversation. And again, you create that connection. Or you're standing online in Starbucks and you have your phone away, you're you're looking out and about, and someone who you haven't seen in years that was someone very important to you. They're like, oh my goodness, Renee, how are you? That happened to me so many times when I was living in California. I thought it was hilarious because I'm from the East Coast. I would see more people from the East Coast in California than I do when I'm actually on the East Coast. But the beauty in that is I was available, right? I was open and and available so that person could even see me <laughs> so you weren't sure. plugged in you weren't plugged in you no. didn't have your things on you 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 weren't glued to the phone doing some instagram posting or some facebook stuff so yeah exactly exactly um writing skills have declined talk to me <laughs> about writing letters writing letters and not just letters michael but being able to write notes. So I have many, my, my sister-in-law, she's been a high school, um, guidance counselor for 10 years. My cousins are all teachers. And I did a big survey of this asking teachers, parents, do you feel as though your children's, uh, writing skills have taken a bit of a hit? Do you notice because of social media and, and across the board, it was 99%. Yes, 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 wow. yes. And the reason why, think about it. We use shortcut spelling. 
Uh, you know, with, with Twitter, it's like, aren't there, there's only a certain amount of character characters you can use. So we shortcut everything. I even find myself doing it. The other day I spelled good night, G O O D N I T E. And I was like, Renee, you're a writer, <laughs> but I'm used to doing that because on texting, we're all trying to be quick. We're all moving so fast these days. And also writing handwritten letters. We just don't do it anymore. It breaks my heart that handwriting is not even being taught in schools anymore. Like I used to, yes, at least here um, in, in New Jersey, it breaks my heart because that was my favorite thing as a kid to learn how to write in cursive and, and script. It's not being taught. And my, my cousin who I'm very close with, she said, she's concerned because she was helping her son get homeschooled and he wasn't able to take notes, like actually take notes from the lessons because they're so used to being on the computer and typing notes. So yes, writing skills have decreased. And you may be saying, well, Renee, why would we need to write? Well, I ask you this, if you were interviewing someone for a job and they had all the skill sets required, you had a great connection, and then you asked them to simply write a paragraph about why they're the best person for the job, and they couldn't write it. And when you read back what they wrote, there was tons of misspelled words. It sounded and felt like a five-year-old wrote it. Wouldn't that make you question? And it's sad because even if they had all the other skill sets to not be able to write makes you doubt that person because writing is a representation of us just like everything we do, just like all the posts we share on social media. They are all a representation of us. So why not have writing be a really positive representation of who we are? I'm constantly carrying around pens. As a writer myself, I I wrote a book, um, yeah, quite some time ago, uh, but only published in 2020. And yeah, writing for me, I've been writing journals in a physical book for the last 16 years. So I write two pages a day in a journal. Um, Writing, yeah, it's, yeah. And my mum worked at a... um, Uniball pens for 30 years. So I'm. Wow. Yeah, <gasps> so wait, do you that. get all the pens you ever I did. wanted? Yeah. <laughs> now, but I'm a, I'm a big person. So I've, I've gone the other side. So I've got about 25 bics. So I do four colors. So all the four <laughs> colors mean something. But yeah, we'll jump into another thing. You touched on something before, which I think is the biggest problem we have in today's society. And that is communication phobia. What is communication phobia? Communication phobia. When you constantly avoid communication beyond a surface level, when you find yourself avoiding having any important conversation, when you push your feelings aside because you just don't want to face it. I shared with you earlier, Michael, I hear so many people saying, I don't, I'm not a confrontational person. When I ask them, well, if that person hurt your feelings or offended you, why did you not share that with them? Oh, I'm not a confrontational person. And I want everyone to understand, and I write this in the book, Michael, you read it, communication does not mean confrontation. They are two separate things. And can communication become confrontational? Sure, but they're not one in the same. And by believing they are, We are holding ourselves back from important conversations, from important connections, and I just want us all to break this myth right here and right now. Yep. Um, Now, we're sort of uh, going short of time, so we might have to get you back for a part two. Would that be okay in the future? Would that be cool? Because there's there's so much in the book. So, we, yeah, we could sit here for two hours. But, yeah, I'd love to get you back for part two and go through everything else in the book. But let's sort of wrap this up for now so we can get you back as well because in the book you talk about the best way to host a Zoom party, which I was on your Zoom party yesterday. Talk to me a little bit about your first Zoom party, and I'll just touch on one last thing before we go as well. So, Zoom party. How do, how do people host it? How do people run a party? Think of it like hosting a physical party. Think about when you invite people over to your house and you're having a birthday party for your child or you're just inviting friends over for drinks. What do you do? You communicate what time, where they should um, find the invite whether you want their shoes to come off or not when they walk in your home, whether you want them to bring a dish or wine, you communicate these things to them. Well, the same holds true for when we host Zoom meetings. 
If you are leading the meeting and you would like everyone's cameras turned on, let them know when they enter the virtual space. If you would like them to ask questions in the chat box, let them know. Let them know where to find the chat box. Think about, it's like that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? It's almost like, think about you have to explain things as if you were explaining it to a child. And not that, that, that's not in a negative way. That's just to be so clear and not assume that people know what to do. Even last night I had my first, it was my virtual book launch party. It was so incredible. I had almost 200 people signed up and I, I could cry thinking of it, but we had to let everyone know from the start, just some housekeeping. Please make sure that you're muted at all times. We're going to have time for questions at the end. So don't fret, have your questions aside. And then we're going to have hands raising later on so we can call on you. So just think that you really want to explain everything. Even if to you, it seems like you're explaining too much. I promise you, you're not. It's better to over communicate at the start always so there's no issues the, the biggest issue with communication phobia just to go back to segue on that really quickly that the worst communication phobia is when someone knows they should call and they don't call and then that turns into a lost relationship relationships are only kept alive with constant communication just like water in a plant um hopefully that makes sense um yes. now last thing before we go so i know you were a theatre actress, I'm not sure if you're still working, but I know you went into the space of being a communications coach and then being able to co-host the Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi's first ever virtual world summit, okay? But what was the transition like from going active with your body to sitting in a chair and getting the military neck and just coaching? Because as a coach myself, I totally understand sitting in the chair all day and just coaching online. Talk to me about that. That is the toughest part for me, Michael, to be completely honest with you. I, I chose to become a coach before the pandemic, before the shutdown, because I knew after Pretty Woman closed and I performed my one woman show, I knew that I was ready for a new chapter in my life. And I always loved coaching and I was already in the process of writing my book. So I decided to become a coach and I took this wonderful course by Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi. And then the pandemic hit. So it was kind of perfect timing, but through that, we were all in our homes and stuck behind a computer and talk about going from a hundred to zero. I'm used to doing eight shows a week, constantly working out my body, up and down subway stairs, bags on my shoulders, dancing in five inch heels. I mean, nonstop. And then to being sedentary behind a computer. And let me tell you, my friends, it is no joke. So what I have realized and what I teach my clients and when I do company trainings, the best way to communicate effectively in our lives, whether it's in person, whether it's on Zoom, especially when it's behind a computer, is to move your body first. Put on a playlist, call it your power prep playlist, put on those songs that pump put you up. Put on the Jersey Boys soundtrack. Yes, baby. Jersey Boys soundtrack and just move your body. If you walk around the block, I have a um, little trampoline I jump on to get the blood flowing. I have my workout machines at home and I move. Even if I don't feel like it, that means that I must. And then when I sit back down, Michael, I'm energized. I feel more like myself and I'm thinking clearer, right? Because it's mind, body, spirit connection. We must, must move our bodies. So that was the hardest part of it for me, but I absolutely love it. I love getting to connect with beautiful people from all around the world like yourself. It's just the greatest gift. <sighs> Amazing. So we'll definitely get you on for part two so we can go through the, the rest of the book. Great. So there's heaps of stuff out there as well. But one last question before we wrap up. Now, if you were to host a dinner party with three people, dead or alive from the past, who would they be and where would you take them? So three people. And I probably know I'm going to say one person, but I'll let you do the three. Who's Oof. the three people? Well, the first one is my father who actually passed away just two years ago. He, my book is dedicated to him. I, I say he was the OG master communicator. He is just, was the greatest man alive. So now that he's in heaven, I'd love to sit with him and be like, dad, what's it like? And then, you know, be like, how's it, how, how am I looking from up there? Get the scoop there. 
I would love to have dinner with Oprah. I mean, come on, pick her brain. Talk about being a sponge and just really understanding everything about her, her communication with self, where her communication style began from. And one of my absolute favorites, Mel Robbins. Robbins, I am such a fan of Mel Robbins. She is, what I love about her the most, I'm just reading her book, The High Five Habit. She is so authentic. And I love that she's so transparent about everything she goes through. Because that to me is what it's about. I always say, I'm not going to go speak to someone. Say you're speaking to a therapist about anxiety and they are, they're like, I've never experienced it. I'm not going to that therapist because the best teachers are the ones who go through it. And what I love about Mel Robbins is she is so honest, brutally honest about everything she goes through, her family goes through. And I believe that that's why she is such an incredible following and people feel so connected to her because they know that she's authentic. So your father, which is, I knew you were going to say that. Uh, so sorry about your loss as well. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oprah and Mel Robbins. Uh, yes. Where would you take him or what would you serve him? What cuisine? Where, where would you take him? Ooh. Well, I'd first have to see, does anyone have any food allergies? <laughs> Is anyone vegetarian? Let's get all that underway first. What's your favorite food? Let's just, let's knock that out of the park. What, uh, what is it? Where, where do you go for your, you and your, yeah, where do you go? Uh, I love food. Guys, I just have to be honest. I love eating. Like eating to me is number one. If I could be, you know, Guy Fierro, uh, diners, drive-ins and dives, he goes around tasting food. That's actually my real dream. Like just be the girl who goes around tasting food and then writing little blurbs about it. Heaven, heaven. Um, but if I had to pick my favorite, it would be lobster ravioli. Wow. Wow. Yes. It sounds like a good meal. So we can serve that to your dad, Oprah yes. and Mel Robbins. Yes. Um, yeah, perfect. Well, Renee, we'll get you back for part two. Uh, I know you've got to run as well. So uh, appreciate you coming on. And now last question. Now, if you were to leave our audience with one message and you had one big billboard in Times Square, what would your one message be that you could give to the audience? Start celebrating yourself every day. We constantly Stop. pick ourselves apart. We are focused on what we haven't accomplished, what we haven't done. How about we flip the script and start celebrating everything that we do, even making the mistakes. That means I tried. Make celebration a priority. Awesome. Thank you, Renee. And thank you for being on the Best Book Bits podcast and uh, all the, the luck and success with your book. Now, where can people go out and purchase your book? You can head to uh, my website, which is great, becomingamastercommunicator.com. That way you read all about the book and, and all the incredible endorsements that I have. Dean Graziosi, Russell Brunson, Chaz Pomentary, Brian Adams, and so many more. Um, becomingamastercommunicator.com or Amazon. Um, all of the outlets where it's it's being sold is on that website. So check it out, order it from where you choose. And I'd love for you guys to send me a message um, on Instagram or my website, reneemarino.com, Instagram at I am Renee Marino. Send me a DM when you get the book, take a photo. I love to share it on my stories. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Thank you. And also go watch the Jersey Boys I did last yes, night. It's on Amazon, yes. rent it as well and watch, watch, uh, Watch Renee in action through there. It might not be her normal character, but God, she plays a good character. So congratulations on that again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. We'll speak to you soon.